Travis, uh, Ray, um, Neil, Amy, um, thank you so much. I, uh, I've met with several of the uh, early career researchers over the last week or so with the shutdown and um, it's very clear that uh, this is a very concerning time. Um, and so anything we can do, I think the goal primarily for this um, for today is to listen to your concerns so we know exactly what it is um, to help maybe going forward. Um, if you have any questions, uh, we have the, the team of experts here, um, like I said, with uh, Amy, Ray, uh, Neil, and Travis. And so um, I think Travis um, and potentially Ray and uh, Neil will have something to say shortly. Um, just for a few minutes, and then we'll open it to questions. Um, so, Travis, did you want to start? Sure. Um, thanks, everyone, for coming again. Um, I just want to say that the, or reiterate that the main point of today is for us to to hear the questions and concerns um, that you have and hopefully provide answers to a lot of those questions, but I suspect it's um, also be uh, collecting these questions and then going and finding some answers and solutions for you. Um, I don't know that we'll have all of the answers for you right away, but we'll certainly endeavor to find them. Um, I know one of the concerns that people have had, uh, and I thought I would start off by, um, just reminding everyone what the uh, MOU states for, and, and this is really for pre-tenure um, faculty. So MUNFA and the university signed an MOU that states basically that uh, we can, you can delay, you can choose to delay for up to two years your tenure. Um, so I'll just read it. ASMs who are currently in a tenure track position and who are contractually obliged to avail of the tenure process in accordance with the collective agreement during future academic years shall have the option to request deferring any such reviews for up to two years in accordance with clause 2288 of the collective agreement. Each request shall be considered on its own merits in the event uh, a deferral request is granted should be subsequent to reviews so should subsequent reviews lead to tenure, your salary adjustment will be retroactive to the September 1st in accordance with the granted deferral, okay? The other thing I want to mention that's already in the collective agreement in 1229 and 1213 for both um, tenure promotion, tenure and promotion uh, criteria, that it says, in addition, the first part is, uh, just refers to teaching, uh, but in addition to the faculty members teaching load in accordance with clause 328 access to research facilities specified at the time of hire. And this is the important part other available infrastructure shall be considered. So, if you're not able to get into your lab for a significant period of time, because, for example, there was a pandemic during your pre tenure years. Um, this will be taken into, uh, will be considered for your tenure application. So that's all I really have to say before I think I'm passing it over to Neil. Thank you, Travis. Uh, I don't say very much. I, uh, um, I would like to say, uh, I think this is a good idea to have a town hall and I'm very glad to be invited. Uh, we all know that um, this is a very challenging peri period and we've been um, working as hard as we can to find ways to uh, try to keep research going um, as strongly as possible in a safer way as possible as well. Uh, and we've had the setback with the uh, outbreak in the community of um, COVID-19, of course which um, uh, put a spanner in the works uh, very much uh, in the last uh, uh, two, three weeks. So um, I won't say any more. I'm very happy to answer questions and uh, look forward to uh, hearing from you. Over to Ray. 
Yeah, th thank you, Neil, and uh, thanks, Travis. I, it, was, it was good to hear that uh, summary of the promotion and tenure. It had, you know, I, I had been asked it, and I, I didn't actually know the answers. So I guess we're kind of a little bit removed from that. So it was good that you prefaced uh, all of this with with some update. Um, I'll keep my remarks brief. I, you know, I recognize many of the names. Not that I've met you all on the screen, but I recognize your names partly through the process of the last year, seeing your names on the on requests that have come in. So uh, if I don't know you to see you, I, many of you, I, I feel I know you at least a, a little bit about what you do. Um, the only thing I'll, I'll add is that you may have seen in the last 24 hours a further update. It seems that they they come fast and furious, but it really is in the spirit of trying to move forward from, uh, from the setback that Neil mentioned, um, which was to start to look at ways to further increase activity research activity uh, on campus. And so th there is a memo that uh, Neil released that uh, notes three criteria that uh, we we are currently looking at and hopefully being able to expand on that in the near future. So, you know, we're all waiting to see what this afternoon brings uh, from the health um, chief medical officer. But anyway, just in, in summary, the three criteria that we've uh, that were communicated yesterday is that uh, uh, requests can be made for on campus activities that can't remain paused for the next couple of weeks without incurring a disproportionate delay or other it characterizes a catastrophic loss of research projects. So if, if the if the loss is disproportionate to the delay, then that would satisfy that criteria. Wherever the research can be done by an individual researcher in a workspace that isn't shared with others, uh, subject to working alone, health and safety procedures, that's the second criteria. And the third, and really this is, I think, well, it applies to everybody, but, but maybe particularly to graduate students, is uh, that the, the undertaking of the research doesn't require them to take unreasonable personal risks in coming and going to campus. So in particular, you know, if they need to drive in shared vehicles with people outside their household, this is just probably not the right public health environment to be, to be setting that up as a, a way for people to come to campus. Uh, and so where those three conditions, uh, criteria can be met, uh, requests should be made and uh, they should uh, they should be approved. In cases where graduate students or postdocs are involved, uh, the Dean of Graduate Studies is also needed to be involved in the, in the decisions. Um, you know, as uh, public health measures allow, obviously we will look at uh, uh, further uh, revising the criteria and, uh, you know, last year we moved through maybe more slowly than any of us would like. Um, but we did move through a staged reopening and, and hopefully based on that experience and uh, and a favorable public health uh, situation, we can move through through these things much more quickly this time around. Both, uh, well, everybody involved here, you know, myself and Neil, uh, Jacqueline, uh, Amy, we're all uh, active researchers who have graduate students that are, um, you know, impacted by, by these kind of decisions as well. So, um, you know, I just wanted to, Impressed that these are not administrative. Uh, this, these are not, not administrative procedures being cooked up, devoid of, of both uh, an understanding of and living uh, uh, the consequences of uh, the things that we are restricting. So, anyway, I'll leave it there and uh, hand it back to Jacqueline. Uh, thanks, Ray, Neil, um, and Travis. Uh... Amy, I don't know if you want to say a couple of words. You don't. I know I'm putting you on the spot, um, or you can just maybe serve more as an answer. Uh, so I did put in the chat the update, the news update um, from the uh, VPR's office, um, and uh, um, as ne uh, Neil and Ray both said, um, the intention is is to do everything we can to facilitate uh, the research, but we are. In a really serious situation right now, um, and uh, the um, the restrictions are not ones that are uh, that we're really willing to toy with uh, very much. Uh, and uh, um, we've heard the um, you know it's come pretty close to home with some of our colleagues um, uh, having relatives or. Um, some of our staff being sick or their children, et cetera. And so I think um, if it, at all you can delay uh, doing your research for uh, a couple of weeks, then um, then that is the guidance that uh, that we're giving. 
from a grad studies point of view, anything that is a procedural kinds of things, extensions of programs, um, paperwork, et cetera, we're uh, uh, flexible on all of those things. Um, we'll continue to do the best we can to extend baselines, but there is um, there is a limit on, on my fellowship budget. So uh, we're doing the best we can to support the students financially and we will, you know, from a, um, a procedures and policies point of view, be, be flexible. Um, and, and we know we'll, we'll need to continue to be flexible um, for well, a couple of years uh, to come. So thanks, Jacqueline. Thank you, Amy. Um, so I know that I noticed there was a comment by Mark Barry in the chat. Um, Mark, did you want to ask that question or just have Travis respond? What would you? I, mean, I can ask. I, I was just wondering if someone chose not to request a deferral uh, with respect to their tenure application, but then their application was denied, would they automatically automatically receive a without prejudice two year extension in which they could reapply? My gut sense, Mark, first, it's a good question. My gut feeling would be, no, you would need to make that uh, decision beforehand before applying, but uh, I've already sent your question to uh, Ian McKinnon to get uh, the the answer for it. And maybe even by the end of the this meeting, we'll have the meeting, but my gut says not that that wouldn't be um, wouldn't be offered. Okay, so really, we need to be erring on the side of caution and advising people to request the deferrals then. I think so. I mean, there, there could be cases, you know, certain types of science where that science can be done at home by by graduate students and the researchers and the PIs um, or can be done remotely. But there's going to be a lot of people who who probably will opt for uh, deferral of the their tenure and, and we should uh, department heads should be helping them to make that decision for sure. Uh, thanks, Mark. Um, there's also been uh, points made raised in the chat about the update from the VPR's office. Um, I apologize. I thought that was sent out. Uh, I will send it out um, again to uh, um, all the faculty or all the departments rather um, as soon as um, this meeting is over. Um, Ray nicely summarized it, um, but nevertheless, uh, a hard copy will or a copy will be sent to all of you. As soon as we're done here, anyone questions? So I do know that um, one of the faculty members submitted a question about IT procurement and our policy right now to delay any orders for um, at level at level red. Um, <clears throat> I wanted to clarify that um, to say that yes, well, explain why we made that decision in the Faculty of Science. Um, we had some um, issues with staff uh, being affected by COVID, um, the situation, and so we were down some staff members. Um, it's also difficult to ask staff members to come in with um, things like, uh, you know, they have to take care of family members or, um, you know, whatever their situation is. And so we are limited with the number of faculty in IT uh, in procurement. Um, we also, um, because we're at level red, we would like to, um, anything that were to be ordered would have to fit with the research criteria under level red. Um, and finally, uh, the thing I wanted to make clear is that we're not unreasonable. <laughs> And so, please come to us if you have a pressing issue um, and we'll, we will do the best we can. I know that last year there were some issues um, with couriers dropping things off uh, and just leaving them at the, at the door. And so, thousands of dollars of, thing, of samples and equipment were lost. Um, and so, we are really trying to prevent that from happening this year, um, obviously, for um, your benefit. And so, 
Um, if you are planning or want to order something that is absolutely critical, um, then please uh, reach out to myself or Gina, and we will do our best to um, resolve that issue for you. We are hopeful that next week will bring a lightning of the um, public health measures, but of course we can't predict that. So um, we'll just have to wait and see. Uh, Dave, do you, uh, David, do you wanna? Um, yeah, sure. I just I just okay. put my question in the chat there, but um, I'm just curious, um, you know, because I'll be doing quite a bit of field work, hopefully over the summer with grad students when they get here. Um, but uh, I'm just wondering how uh, applications for field work on the island um, would be sort of reviewed um, with sort of pub public health measures compared to on campus research. So, Ray, if you want to take that. Yeah, uh, David, I don't know if you were involved through the last, uh, you know, spring summer when we 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 had a field work uh, request form, which we will um, put up again when we're able to entertain requests for field work. Uh, the intention would be that they would be reviewed in the same manner as the on campus request form. So the same process that would go through. Um, well, the dean, or in this case, uh, Jacqueline. Uh, and then on to the HS. So uh, it would be a similar process to the on campus research, but would be the questions will be a little more will be a little more focused on uh, things relevant to field work. And, and we'll get uh, those forms updated soon. But uh, at the moment, we're not taking requests for that. It's a little bit down the road, but uh, it'll be similar. Thank you. Um. I know also uh, a question was raised about sending samples off and that's related to the um, previous uh, procurement um, response I gave. Uh, again, that's research related. So you really have to apply for an exemption. Um, uh, and if it fits under the criteria, then we will do our best to send your samples out. Uh, we certainly don't want any delays. Um, you know, it, either in dropping them off to procurement so that they are ruined or even on the other side, right, being delivered to a place that um, is shut down. And so we will do our best to ensure that measures um, are in place to prevent both of that. But again, that falls under research. And so um, you need to provide a research exemption uh, request for, for something like that. Uh, Heather, oh, sorry, did, one, did I see a hand raise? Oh, yeah, Neil. Actually, I was going to respond to Heather's question. At what point do you expect fieldwork to be entertained? And this comes uh, directly in line with what's happening from the Chief Medical Officer of Health. So as the uh, province changes the um, constraints on um, uh, travel within the province and moves down the alert levels, uh, we will also um, move to um, uh, reactivate field work. And in the detailed way of that, how that might happen, uh, Ray may want to comment. Yeah, maybe I can combine a little bit. Uh, I see Amy has a question in the box as well. Um, so the last time around when we, we, re we reintroduced the option or opportunity for field work to commence, um, you know, in, in the first instance, it was uh, field work that could be done from St. John's without requiring overnight stays, uh, you know, or other similar constraints put on it. And so I, I guess they reflected the public health situation of the day. So I, I guess the constraints that might be on the resumption of field work would depend on the public health uh, directives or advice. Uh, or pleadings or whatever way you, you interpret the chief medical officer of health's uh, communications, but uh, you know I, I expect they would be they would be phased in, uh, you know certainly within the province uh, in the first instance. I mean, a hypothetical would be you know if they open up the west coast of the province, is it really a good idea for researchers from St. John's campus to be traveling to the west coast if if uh, you know if uh, public health uh, on the on the Avalon is uh, 
is still a, you know, a, a different alert level. So I, I think things have changed in the year. We would need to reevaluate exactly how we open up. Um, and, uh, but I would expect it would be, it would be similar to the way it was handled before if the public health um, directives are similar and with some kind of gradual reopening. Uh, but it's hard, you know, going back to Heather's comment, when do we expect it to be entertained? I mean, I guess we can entertain them in the near term, at least requests, but when they could actually commence activity, it's just hard to predict. I, I, I don't know. I, mean, I don't think any of us really in the province really thought we'd be where we are. I mean, we were campus was charging back to full full on February 1 and then February 8th we're all off, you know, everything's off. So it's it's hard to it's really hard to predict as soon as it's feasible to do so. What I would say is people who are anticipating field work for the spring and have to do in lab work to get ready for it and you know can comply with whatever um, criteria are in effect, for example, today and what we might relax and you know, uh, certainly it would be sensible to be getting ready, but uh, getting ready cannot be confused with with an uh, at, uh, at a little further down the road. Uh, yes, yeah, so I was going to follow up again on Heather Leader's um, comment. The the our intention is drawing yes of course and uh, we are trying as we did last year our aim is to get things back uh, operational as soon as possible um, we're certainly not trying to keep things down the research output of the university depends on researchers doing things and we are in a fortunate position uh, in some ways, actually, in research, is that the numbers that are needed on campus, and this relates to the previous question too from Talia Stockman, the, the, the numbers on campus to do research are relatively low. And so um, keeping, um, by not having uh, undergrad staff or grad students in class on the campus allows research lab work to be more easily done in line with the density uh, restrictions on um, who is allowed on campus or how many people are allowed on campus. And that uh, relates also to Talia's comment um, that um, uh, around um, uh, why is it we can't keep going when businesses can? And, and that's, um, uh, it's a very different situation. We've got, um, uh, potentially thousands of people involved and um, uh, individual businesses and um, most of them anyway don't have that and most of the businesses that are bigger than that are on the uh, in line with the essential types of services so um, how do the numbers compare to other universities in Canada well our situation is different from other universities in Canada and what we um, have tried to do is is operate in as safe a manner as possible and as you've seen the um the things that have happened across canada have been spotty um you know campuses coming back and then having to go into lockdown and so on and so forth uh, so far as uh ehs uh, people said yesterday uh, there's been no obvious transmission of covid on our campus uh, that is known about in any case. Uh, Ray, I don't know if you want to follow up on some of those points. Yeah, yeah, sure. Maybe I'll just touch on Talia's question and then back to Heather had a point that I, I'll touch on as well. But um, just to add to Neil's comment, um, you know, I've been recently in contact with Dalhousie and they've been proceeding since around September with uh, a 25% rule, I think is what they call it, meaning that density research uh, spaces on campus can have densities no more than 25% of normal activity. So, you know, it's, uh, I, I would, I believe based on uh, our fall that we had activity levels much, would have been much higher than that. I, I think, you know, while we had a process in place to request access, by the time we got into our um, level three and level two, 
anybody who needed to have access uh, was able to get access. So, you know, while we were still encouraging people not to to come on campus if they didn't really have to, anybody who felt they had to could come. So, um, I, I I think our you know the, the, there's, there's comparable uh, probably levels of activity that we that we've had. Um, I I'm also um, I have an appointment at the University of Toronto and I have graduate students there and I know that they have not been back in their labs at all this year. I'm not saying U of T is completely shut down, but the nature of what uh, I've been involved with there, you know, uh, the the tests of getting back on uh, our activity wouldn't have really met those tests. So the people have been working remotely. Um, to Heather's comment about uh, what do I, when do you expect you mean as soon as the university, I don't know that you can say as soon as the university goes to yellow. If you, if you read the yellow, it says low risk field work. So I think what, what it really means is that when we get into the yellow phase, activity that is deemed to be low risk uh, will, you know, will likely be able to proceed. And, and what does that, it probably, it means a risk assessment of some kind for each activity. So, you know, I know last year we, we went through this sort of thing with EHS, environmental health and safety, and, you know, activities that involve people going out and doing some sampling in the field uh, where, Physical distancing could be uh, achieved, and and uh, there was uh, no need for people to travel in in vehicles together if they were from outside their their bubbles. That proceeded fairly quickly once we started field work. But if you needed to work shoulder to shoulder in a confined space uh, with somebody who's not in your bubble, uh, that was deemed uh, higher risk, and that proceeded much much later. Uh, you know, and needed a different kind of uh, intervention from a, a health and safety perspective. So. You know, I expect as soon as we move into yellow that we will be inviting applications for field work. The test will be the level of risk and it's not it's not an academic test. It's not the academics testing it. It's a health and safety uh, risk assessment done by EHS as opposed to a group of academics. Great, um, thank you. Uh, well, other thing I would mention is with this variant, it's a, a lot more transmissible. And so that's a that's an added concern. And quite frankly, from public health perspective, hospitals, we just don't have the capacity if COVID is spread and people are really sick. We don't have the capacity. I think there's 14 ICU beds in Newfoundland. And so that's very different than a situation like Quebec and Ontario, who may have the luxury of um, you know, more um resources, I guess. And so we're a little unique in um in that front i think i think we're also you know we're lucky that our uh, chief medical officer has done what she's done because i think this is i'm hoping i think we're all hoping this is going to be you know short term pain and we'll be back i mean 3 weeks ago we were doing research on campus um and a lot more research capacity than our colleagues in ontario and quebec um, right now, yes, we're shut down, but, you know, hopefully it, it seems like Newfoundlanders and Labradorians, especially here on the Avalon have been following the advice of the chief medical officer. The numbers are coming down and, you know, I'm, I'm confident that in the next few weeks, we'll start to see the research, um, capacity grow. That's what we want for sure. Um, one of the comments about grants, I think, um, uh, just a recent comment by Scott, uh, with regards to NSERC in particular, I did just get off the NSERC panel last week and I was amazed actually how little was mentioned about COVID. I'm hoping that next year will be quite, quite a bit different, um, and likely the lack of COVID related. Um, concerns um, was because of the short duration between when COVID happened and when NSERC was due. Um, but uh, I guess we'll have to wait to see what NSERC, um, uh, what their policies are uh, coming forward. The other grants um, uh, renewals. Yeah, uh, I don't know if um, Ray, uh, or Travis want to speak, or Neil, yeah, go ahead, want to speak to you. In, in terms of um, uh, gap cycles, of course, we don't have uh, a big bucket of money that um, uh, can be replaced the NSERC cycles. We do have our bridge program, though, um, for 
uh, which is very limited and tiny. Um, and this will vary, actually. I mean, some people will probably do quite well out of um, um, working remotely, and others will be will struggle because they can't access um, on campus facilities. So it, it is a uh, uh, a mixture of things. I can see things rolling in faster than we're responding. So maybe we um, go to the questions. Yeah, sorry about that. Uh, Scott, you had a question? Yeah, I, I don't know who's best to answer it. Um, it. Let's say in two hours, we find out to sustain our bread for another little while. Does the VPR office have a plan to start scaling up some of the core services like create? Um, I submitted a level red, which in my mind probably wasn't really level red anyway, but I had to submit it because I'm in the catch 22 of create is not operating, even though I can drop samples off to create to which a very low density of create staff in their labs could run these samples and then my students can work remotely on those computers to analyze the data. So, uh, but create is not operating and you can't get level red approved unless create approves the work that you're asking them to do. So it's a bit of a circular event. And then related to Travis and procurement, uh, what are we gonna do? How are we gonna deal with the backlog of orders that's gonna flood in um, uh, if we can't order um, supplies right now <laughs> if we do switch down to the next level? So to answer the create question, create is of course affected just like the other um, uh, researchers, individual research labs and so on. And uh, they are managed by uh, our staff in, in um, uh, Siri. So, um, uh, so they are on reduced operation because they're not, um, um, the, uh, most of them are not um, working at the level they were working at beforehand, before uh, February 1st. So um, that's why we have in the um, requirement for uh, putting in a request uh, that you talk with the um, uh, director or manager of CREATE uh, so that you um, know what is possible and what uh, can be done during the red uh, period. And when it comes to the, the procurement, um, so like Jacqueline said at the beginning, uh, our, our Faculty of Science procurement uh, office was also hit by, um, affected by COVID, children at home, things like that. They are open, they're taking deliveries. We suspect that, well, Monday morning, uh, we'll be meeting to, to start to, to push procurement through a little bit for things that need to get going. You know, Jacqueline and I were talking about the, um, you know, potential for field work, say, in April, and people need to start buying things now. Well, we'll take a look at that and make sure that it's safe to do so, but we have to hear back from uh, public health first. Yeah, just to follow up to Neil's comment there, I went through the pathway you just suggested, but it came back to you, basically. <laughs> <laughs> nothing that, that yeah it comes back to you because there's no operations in create right now there's nothing operating other than keeping machines from breaking and i submitted then my proposal through to jackman i don't want to make this about me i'm just saying i can't be the only one in this circumstance and so i submitted my my proposal to jackman stating that i needed create permission to operate uh brent knows what i need to do i, I communicated it to him but it's just kind of just left to uh, pointing fingers towards where it needs to go. And it's all everyone say. I, I just, I don't feel like there's a, there's a clear plan of, of uh, prioritizing research that's low risk as opposed to essential. Because mine is very low risk, what I'm suggesting. If Siri is, if Create's operating, if you have a condition where you're saying Create can't operate machines, well then I just wanted that communicated, that's all. Well, we, we Create is operating in red too. So if Brent says that he hasn't got staff in, he, he's the manager of Create. So uh, we, we um, go along with um, w with the process that's in place. Um, and um, uh, as I say, they have to operate under the red level too. I mean, let me remind everyone that red is very severe. It's nothing goes unless it's absolutely essential. Um, 
I'm going to switch. I think they may want to comment on that point too, but I want to switch to the question from Talia Stockman about um, a shift work model to say that actually, uh, well, first of all, work in the individuals' research labs are one thing, and certainly not part of the um, uh, directly part of what the VPR decides, but the the um, uh, our work in um, uh, the tech services has operated a double shift work right through from uh, last uh, July, August or so to, to actually get as many people back uh, as possible to make sure that as many uh, tech services services were available as possible. Um, so where we can, we do. Um, uh, same with our animal care operations. I think Ray had some comments too. Yeah, just yeah. on a couple of comments on Talia's question, uh, very specifically uh, in the memo that was released yesterday, it uh, says with respect to requests for researchers need to access the same on campus research space. And this is again in the context of at the moment, it's single, single individual accessing. Ensure that the request clearly describes how scheduling of space will be carried out to ensure that only one researcher uses the space at any one time and how cleaning of the spaces will be carried out between users. So it's it's contemplating what you are talking about, some type of shift work. And I would expect that as we increase and relax further and allow multiple users into uh, you know, common spaces subject to physical distancing and PPE, that uh, you know, if you think back to the Dow situation where you've got a 25% rule, then you have no choice but to have uh, uh, to have shifting, and that is what you'd put in your health and safety plan. And uh, you know, if it's put in there, and that's the, the way to manage access, and uh, there's there is a scheduling uh, process. I, I don't expect anybody would be pushing back on it. Uh, so yes, it it is. Uh, it is what is being considered. In fact, it was it was always what was contemplated, uh, and and occasionally we'd see it in uh, in the health and safety plans as to way people people would deal with labs that would normally have uh, a larger number of people in than any kind of physical distancing would allow. We we did see the the uh, staggering of uh, of access. So so it should be put in as a, as part of your plan. Um, just a comment on. Uh, the create, um, I, I see Mark's comment there. I mean, if there's confusion about, uh, you know, who's who's doing the, who moves first, we'll make sure that that's clarified. But the, the, the process is where, um, you know, before you put a request in the system, you, you know, whether it's create or animal care or tech services or, you, you know, your own departments, your own resources, they should be uh, secured and confirmed in advance and then put your request in and if create is, Kind of looking for an approval prior. We'll make sure that that uh, there isn't confusion there. I, I'm surprised there would be, but but there could well be. Um, but but as Neil said, they've been in red at the moment, so they're not doing research. Uh, back to Scott's point, they are maintaining their equipment as as uh, as the red until yesterday had uh, contemplated. Uh, I'd like to add a little bit um, about the research exemption. Um, forms. It is really beneficial to me in particular to be as explicit as possible and there can't be too much detail added to that, particularly in the justification for why this is um, important uh, and or critical. Uh, I, I'm new to this position and I don't know your research. Um, and so please don't assume that I do. <laughs> uh, I know some of your research, um, but please be as ex explicit as possible. Um, it makes this process go really quickly. And what I would say, um, and I have nothing but good things to say about EHS, is how quickly they come back. Um, and so once the department head, if the department head approves your application um, and it comes to me, within a couple of hours generally, um, I've reviewed it and it's gone to EHS. That process can be within 24 hours. So you can get approval super quick as long as I have the information I, I need in order to make that um, decision. So please be, um, there's, I guess, err on the side of too much information. Um, 
uh, so that I can, I can best determine, because I don't want to say no, but with incomplete applications, um, I, I have to, and it just delays the process. It's a make work project for everyone. So, um, particularly with the new criteria, um, please be as explicit as possible. Uh, okay, I feel like, did I miss, what am I missing? Um, two questions from uh, Mike. Uh, hey there. I, I'm just I'm going to change direction a little bit. So if there's things to tie off here, uh, I'd be happy to delay a bit. But otherwise, if uh, Heather, Heather, Heather had a uh, comment, I think, which was just in response to what Jacqueline was saying, and I can answer it. I mean, you know, it should be concise and focused on the criteria, and it's not a grant application. So you know, things don't need to be in there that you'd put into convince somebody of the merit of the work it what what it really is about is 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 putting enough information in to convince that the criteria are being met don't you know no need to overreach and try and do more than than what's uh, allowable under the criteria that just causes everybody who's not an expert in this confusion and it delays the process so if you need more than 300 words obviously yes i mean it's a, it's a guideline there's nothing stopping there's no there's no cutoff of words in the in the word document, but, but, but don't, please don't send us grant applications. It needs to be concise. And 1 other thing, Mike, just, or, um, just before we move on, um. If you have questions about the criteria in advance, just send me an email and ask me, um, instead of submitting and then I go through Gail, which goes back to your head department head, which goes back to, um. You know, you as a researcher, just send me a quick email. Um, I'm happy to you, you know, work with you to develop your application or not develop your application, but make it so that um, when it comes forward, there's less questions. So, uh, excuse me as you see fit. Okay, sorry. Uh, go ahead. Yeah, I can probably launch in on the costs as well. Uh, 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 the question from Michael Katz about reducing fees. Um, you know, in one sense, everything is uh, 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 struggling, and the uh, CRCEF uh, primarily was associated, well, not primarily, was associated only with direct costs of research. So those uh, that feedback from the federal government went directly to you as researchers when there were expenses that were uh, being incurred that... Um, um, which um, uh, didn't lead to uh, research outputs for create tech services and the like. We're actually seeing substantial reduction in our revenues this year because we're not in operation, and uh, so uh, and yet we still have to pay the salary. So um, we will um, uh, have an e we do have an issue to make sure we keep the show on the road. And the the important thing here is to. Um, um, to ensure that uh, we don't reduce services or there isn't a, a possibility of reducing services uh, over the, uh, the next year or so. And that means that uh, essentially the university is subsidizing or will be subsidizing more for, for this year during the pandemic than it has been in the past. So it's very difficult to um, consider uh, uh, redu reducing fees because, as I've said before, we don't have a large bucket of money um, to, on which to draw on. Uh, great, thanks. Sorry about that, Mike. I missed that um, your question there in the chat. Uh, okay, so uh, Mike Babchuk, <laughs> you're up. <laughs> uh, first of all, thank you for putting this on. It's been the informative. Thank you for taking the time. Um, I had two questions. One, um, kind of longer term impact things. Uh, one, I guess, medium term. I want to circle back a bit towards the P and T side. I, I appreciate the offer of an extension, but that's a you know, and we're not. I'll, I'll probably preface this by saying we're not in it for the money. But that's a two year delay on the P and T process. Is there going to be additional consideration or training for P and T uh, or ways to handle this? A P and T. Um, committees at the level of departments and evaluations within the faculty to say, hey, these years before the pandemic are a good representation of what I've been doing or what I can do or where I'm going. Here is the, the big pandemic block, um, but maybe instead of delaying somebody's kind of 
you know, surety or the, the PNT process, is there going to be a way just to say, um, if letters are particularly harsh and not representative, we're going to consider this in a case by case basis. Anyway, I just, I just don't think that it's a full solution just to say, well, kick it down the can, you know, kick the can down the road for two years. So I was just kind of curious about um, any discussions there. So I can, I can stop there because my other question is completely unrelated. And <laughs> we can, I guess I can pick back up after that. But. That's a, a great question, Mike. Um... With with not such uh, a great answer, I don't think. Um, I think for sure the committee will, um, with what I said uh, at the beginning, the committees will be, you know, trained on that one part of the collective agreement where it says that, you know, we have to take into account the availability of infrastructure. So not being able to get into your labs. Um, the tenure case is made, um, based on, on the criteria set out in the, in the collective agreement. So you're right. It, it, and what it says in there is based on your performance, is there a reason to say that you're going to continue to perform well or better in the future? And that's what the committee, uh, is supposed to make the judgment on, and then that gets brought up to the head, the dean, and then the provost. Um, kicking the can down the road, I think. I mean, in in some cases, I'm not sure if this is in your case, but there's going to be people who haven't had a chance to do any field work, uh, at least in one season, they've missed it. So, the the ability to show that is going to be hampered so it's better for them to get another year or two of field work in in the future um and the money thing i'm not i i'm not sure what you were saying but it's not if you when you get tenure i'm going to say when you get tenure if you delay it for two years you, the the pay raise which i i understand you know not everyone's in it for the money is retroactive to when you would have gotten tenure so financially, you're delayed in getting that pay, but you will get paid. And if I may as well take this time to answer the initial question that Mark had asked, uh, because I did get back um, from Ian McKinnon, and I was correct in that, you know, you need to make the decision to either go for tenure at the time or delay it for one or two years. There's there's not going to be a I'm going to test it out. If I fail, then I'll do it again in two years. I had a second question, Mike. Uh, yeah, the second question was um, one of the things that we deal with uh, for the lab instrumentation side and people who kind of rely on that type of infrastructure. Um, and one of the big upcoming things right now is the movement of a lot of instrumentation to the new core science facility. And every piece of instrumentation requires often an engineer to come onto campus, which has to go through all of the provincial approvals. If we get caught into a scenario of moving something, but then having it down and we can't have somebody to come and put it back up, is there consideration just to say, given the scenario, the instrument's working in its current space, let's just keep the building, you know, the core science building being renovated, et cetera. And then maybe delay the move of an instrument just to keep research research productivity of somebody who would rely on that equipment, allowing them to still get graduate students to collect data, et cetera, et cetera, just until we know a little bit more about when travel restrictions provincially are going to be lifted. Because I can see that being quite impactful for if somebody can't collect data for two years, even though we've gone through these alert levels down towards yellow or green, but because we can't get somebody here or they're backlogged with all these other instruments, that, that can be a longer term impact, I think, on some people's research programs. So, so I, I'm not sure I've got the complete gist of your uh, question, but uh, I do know that in um, uh, uh, one thing that has been continuing because um, the workers coming in have been classed as exempt workers. Um, so um, the maintenance of those um, pieces of equipment which have required external uh, technical support, that has continued. 
up until the time we went into red anyway, um, the, the period, the circuit breaker with the red uh, happening has thrown a spanner in the works uh, for people coming in from outside. Um, and hopefully that will be temporary and we'll get back to the situation where uh, create another or, um, it, you know, um, lab uh, managers have been able to work with the um, the maintenance people to come in as, as exempt workers. There's been a huge amount of work to ensure that um, that has been possible and the equipment remains in use. Um, I don't know if that totally answers your question. Perhaps you could comment. Uh, well, kind of, yeah. And I've been impressed with the efforts that have still kind of been going on behind the scenes with the exemptions and making sure the stuff's moving forward. But I just see the, the recipe potentially for the spanner to keep being thrown in um, you know, if there's a rush to say, let's get everything moved all at once, rather than say, okay, let's deal with this, move it, make sure we get the exemption in, get some, get this studied. Uh, I'll give an example of say our laser ablation system. Um, you know, there's four or five faculty members routinely in our sciences that would use it. As soon as it goes offline, it's a complex move. There's already months just to move it. But then if there's a, a spanner that comes in at any point there, then the longer term impacts of getting that back up and running might not have been worth just saying, well, let's hold off and keep this going because all the gas lines are there, everything's hooked up, it's, it's free flowing, it's working. That's gonna keep research productivity, that's gonna keep students going through. So just you know, maybe having some of those conversations because I kind of worry about that potential impact. Um, anyway. Well, you can certainly, Ray, if, if it's a create operation, I'd suggest you talk with Brent about that. Um, the, the intention is to, to try and keep things operational as and only down for as short a time as possible. Um, I don't know of the case that Mark Berry is referring to with an external technician for eight months. We, we um, as far as I know, we've had um, um, uh, fairly uh, constant um, um, attendance by uh, technicians coming in service equipment. Um, and we work as best we can to ensure that happens. So um, um, certainly we, uh, our intentions are the same as yours. We want to make sure that um, things continue as much as possible uh, in a very uh, difficult situation. As I, I'll repeat again that the, um, uh, the circuit breaker period of two, uh, since uh, COVID got out into our community, uh, is a very different situation than it was uh, just three weeks ago. And so um, uh, we are um, working our way through this uh, situation. Um, and the, another thing is that um, the instrumentation that you're talking about, Michael, is um, it require you and I aren't going to unplug our instruments. These are supposed to be moved by the companies. And they're not going to be unplugged or, or taken out of commission unless the company can come here and move them. So, as far as I know, so th that's all going to be taken into account. The plan is we're going to start the move uh, in May, and you know, hopefully, we'll be able to get these um, these companies here to to do the movement. Yeah, no, thanks for that. Yeah, and, th and that's why I assumed, yeah, you're not going to go forward until the time is right. But some of these companies that have one or two engineers across North America, and they're similarly going to be backlogged. So it's just, yeah, no, I, I just, but yeah, it'd be great to see things continuing to move and pump out data until the point that somebody's actually here to unplug it and kind of, you know, get ready to move it. So thank you for that. I appreciate it. Uh, so I'm cognizant of the time. It's uh, 1227. I don't know if anyone else has um, a pressing question um, they'd like answered or at least um, uh, responded to uh, before we clue this up. Okay. No fingers tapping. <laughs> All right, well, uh, I appreciate your time. Um, like I said, uh, I'm always um, open if there was a question that um, is still pressing that um, wasn't um, 
fully answered or if you want more information, please don't hesitate to reach out to any of us. I've been using Ray uh, probably a little more than I should um, to get some help with some of these research exemption questions because, uh, um, you know, this is a new situation for myself, but also uh, switching so quickly to level um, red, uh, I think has been a bit unusual um, and unexpected. Hopefully we'll have some more information for you next week. Again, I will send out that, resend out that, um, the new criteria from the BPR's office. Uh, and don't forget that if um, you want to go back and listen to any of this, or if you know any colleagues who might be interested, please let them know that we will be posting this. So, unless anyone has anything else to say. Thanks a lot, Ray and Neil, for, uh, for coming. This was really helpful for all of us, I think. And thanks everyone else for your questions, because it's helpful for us to understand what the concerns are. Yeah, thanks yeah. for the invitation and I'm happy to do it again if you uh, want to invite me again. Absolutely. Thank you so much. Uh, yes, I appreciate your all time. Bye-bye.